Here's a question for all you drivers out there. What do you do when you see one of these? You know what it means, I hope, but do you ignore what it says? Last year, when the building work behind the bungalows next door to the vicarage began, we had one of these outside our house. And I cannot tell you the number of people who drove right round it and then found, surprise, surprise, the road ahead was closed. One evening, I actually went out and moved it so it was right in the middle of the road and a van literally mounted the pavement to drive round it. And then, of course, he had to mount the pavement again to get back when he realised the road ahead was closed. Of course, it's a silly example. But how good are you at responding to warning signs? Whether they might be about your health, your life, your relationships, your faith. Or do you carry on regardless and then get stuck? Because the truth is, knowing is not enough. It's no good being able to read the words of best sign if you ignore them. It might as well be written three random words in Aramaic on a palace wall. Belshazzar had many warnings, in particular the humbling of his predecessor Nebuchadnezzar that we heard about last week. The problem was he didn't listen. He ignored the warnings. He refused to learn the lesson that the Most High God is sovereign over all kingdoms and sets over them anyone he wishes. Verse 21. You should remember those words from last week. It is the lesson Nebuchadnezzar learned eventually and it is the lesson that Belshazzar refused to learn to his cost. My great-grandfather kept telling people that the Titanic was going to sink, but everyone either ignored him or told him to keep his mouth shut. Eventually, they called security and had him thrown out of the cinema. In Daniel chapter 5, we skip ahead several years, at least 25 years, in fact, after chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar is dead and Daniel has apparently fallen out of favour. The king is called Belshazzar. Belshazzar had a fairly complicated route to the throne. We don't have complete records, but Nebuchadnezzar died in 562 BC and was succeeded by his son, Evil Merodach, who reigned for a year or so before being assassinated by his brother-in-law, Neroglissa. Neroglissa ruled for four years before being succeeded by his son, Labash Marduk. Within a month, he was killed by conspirators and Nabonidus, Belshazzar's father, was installed as king. But he went off the rails and after a major argument with the priests, he ended up being relocated to an oasis 500 miles away from Babylon. And so Belshazzar, his son, ruled from 553 to 539 BC. Six kings in under 10 years. Babylon got through kings like Premier League football clubs get through managers. So when we hear Nebuchadnezzar referred to as Belshazzar's father in verses 11, 18 and 22, it's not in the literal sense, they weren't related, probably, but in the figurative sense that Belshazzar was Nebuchadnezzar's successor. Chapter 5 then begins with Belshazzar throwing a mighty feast for a thousand of his nobles, verse 1, and all his wives and his concubines, verses 2 and 3. I have to say, I love my wife, but one wife is enough for me. He was pretty pleased with himself. As a city, Babylon was impregnable with its high and multi-walled defences. At least... It was as impregnable as the Titanic was unsinkable, that is, only in the minds of its arrogant creators. At the height of the feast, Belshazzar ordered his servants to bring the gold and silver goblets that had been taken from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, verse 2, and with them he drank wine 
and praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood and stone. Verse 4. Nebi Belshazzar mocked the Most High God, the only one who could save him, and instead praised the so-called gods who could do nothing to rescue him from Cyrus, king of Persia, whose armies surrounded his city. Here's some graffiti I found online. Things I hate. One, vandalism. Two, lists. Three, irony. Four, lists. Five, repetition. F, inconsistency. This writing on the wall was a bit more serious than that. Although the way the story is told is meant to make us laugh. I mean, has anyone in the history of Drunken Kings, and it's a long history, sobered up more quickly than Belshazzar? He went from joking about God to becoming a joke himself. His face turned pale, verse 6, and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. This king is a joke, the writer says. But so are his advisors. Once again, the enchanters, astrologers and diviners, the king's wise men, were summoned. Verse 7. And what happens next? Once again, they were clueless. Verse 8. Pagan religion was useless in chapter 1, useless in chapter 2, useless in chapter 3, useless in chapter 4, and surprise, surprise, it's useless again in chapter 5 of Daniel. At this, the so-called king, Belshazzar, became even more terrified and his face grew more pale. Verse 9. The queen mother, the king's mum, heard the commotion and came into the banquet hall. Verse 10. And the writer mocks the king again through the queen's words. Don't look so pale, she says. What a dweeb, the writer wants us to think, if dweeb is a word in Biblical Aramaic. She reminded her son about Daniel. In verses 11 and 12, the one who had true insight and intelligence and wisdom, i.e. unlike the other advisors, things the king sorely needed. And so Daniel was summoned and then mocked by this pale-faced, sorry excuse for a king. I don't know about you, but I can see all the nobles sniggering into their goblets as Belshazzar sneered. Verse 13, are you Daniel, one of the exiles my father the king brought from Judah? First, he mocked the only God who could save him. Then, he demeaned the only one who could advise him. Then, he made one of the most meaningless offers in the history of useless gifts, worthy of Blackadder himself to be the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Verse 16. Does that sound good? The third highest ruler in the kingdom? Well, within hours, that kingdom would no longer exist. No wonder Daniel said, you may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. Verse 17. Ouch. Daniel reminded Belshazzar what happened to Nebuchadnezzar, how he was driven away from people and lived with the wild donkeys, literally making an ass of himself, until he learned this lesson. The Most High God is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and sets over them anyone he wishes. Verse 21. That was the lesson Nebuchadnezzar learned, and that is the lesson Belshazzar had not. However, Daniel was not finished. Verse 22. But you, Belshazzar, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You did not honour the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Friends, knowing is not enough. You knew all this, Daniel said, but he ignored it. Knowledge is useless. Wisdom is useless. Truth is useless. 
unless it makes a difference in us, unless we act on it, unless we change. Otherwise, we're no better than the van driver who mounted the curb outside the vicarage to avoid the road ahead close sign. The road is still closed. You're the idiot for ignoring it. The writing was on the wall for Belshazzar, and it was four words, verse 25, mene, mene, tekel, and parsin. Here is what these words mean, Daniel said. Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Perez, the singular of parsin, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Excuse my Aramaic pronunciation. The words meant numbered, numbered, weighed, divided. And it didn't take long for Daniel's words to come true. For a few short hours, he was the third highest ruler in the kingdom, verse 29, after Nabonidus, the exile king, and Belshazzar, the pathetic excuse for a king. But that very night, verse 30, the Persian army broke through the so-called impregnable defensive walls of Babylon and the best defended city in the world was overrun. Herodotus says that the Persians dug a canal to divert the river Euphrates into a basin, lowering the water level of the river so the Persian commandos could wade through the city, get under the walls and mount a surprise attack while the king of Babylon feasted. Belshazzar was slain, verse 30, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom, verse 31. Thus was the first fulfilment of the words Daniel spoke 60 years earlier when he explained Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the statue. The Babylonians had captured, brutalised, brainwashed and mocked God's servants. But who was left standing when the Babylonian Empire fell? Daniel, the servant of God. Remember those dynamite words at the end of chapter 1? And Daniel remained. Chapter 1, verse 21. Why? Because no matter what kings and queens and emperors might think, the Most High God is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and sets over them anyone he wishes. He's in charge and no one else, not even you. The problem these kings had was not ignorance, it was insolence. Knowing is not enough. The truth that God Most High is, well, most high and sovereign, that is a tremendous truth, if you want to serve him. For he is the only solid ground on which we stand and never fall. Daniel remained. For those who serve God, it is a tremendous truth. But it is a terrible truth for those who want to try to take his place. We've now had the same lesson three weeks in a row. The Most High God is sovereign over all and all includes me, and all includes you. I wonder what bits of your life you like to keep back for yourself. What bits of your life and character you like to pretend you don't need to change. The anger, the greed, the grumpiness, the envy, the self-centeredness, the gossip, the laziness, the desire, the pride. Friends, the Most High God is sovereign over all. And all means all. Everything. Everything. Are you willing to turn away from the sin you like to nurture, to stop telling yourself 
you can't help it or it's just who you are. And don't go pretending other people need it more than you. Knowing is not enough. We must turn. We must turn our back on the ways of the world and be transformed and renewed. And that only happens by the Spirit. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer yourselves to God as a living sacrifice. This is true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 12 verses 1 and 2. We need to turn. We need to turn away from all of that sin and recognise that the Most High God is sovereign over all and submit to him and be transformed by him. The Most High God is sovereign over all. May we not only know that, but live it. Amen.